The conjugate beam method is taking the moment area method a step further, and this time we're going to create a fake beam or a conjugate beam, and we're going to use that to solve for slope and deflection. So the conjugate beam reactions. If the connector on the real beam allows for rotation, then the conjugate beam is going to have a slope reaction. For example, a pen allows for rotation but prevents translation. That's why it has an X reaction and a Y reaction. So that means on the conjugate beam, I'm going to replace the pen with a slope reaction. If the connector on the real beam allows for translation, then the conjugate beam is going to have a deflection moment. For example, if we have a free end on the real beam, then over here on our conjugate beam, we're going to have a moment that represents deflection. By the way, on a free end, it also allows for slope. So there would also be a theta. Hinges and mid-span pens are funny. So if on the real beam, I have a pen acting just somewhere in the middle of the beam, Then on my conjugate beam, I'm going to replace that with a hinge. This works vice versa. If we've got a hinge on the real beam, then we represent it with a mid-span pen on the conjugate beam. We've seen this beam before in moment area method. It's simply supported with two 100 kip foot moments applied, and we want to find the slope at A and the deflection at C. This time we're going to use the conjugate beam method. We need two things for the conjugate beam method. First is the conjugate beam, where our reactions are replaced with slopes and deflections, and then second is we're going to load that conjugate beam with the moment diagram. From the moment area method lecture, we know that the moment diagram looks like this. So now I can draw my conjugate beam. The first thing I want to do is draw a beam that is the same size as the one that I was started with. Next, I'm going to replace the connectors with slopes and deflections. So I have a pen at A, and A prevents translation, so there's no deflection but it allows for rotation. So that means I can replace this with theta A. Roller B does not allow deflection, but it also allows rotation. So I'm going to replace roller B with a theta B. Then I'm going to load my conjugate beam with my moment diagram. It looks really funny because I had to stack everything uh, but you'll notice that first I did my positive area or my positive distributed load in purple and it's pointing up. And then I have my two negative moments or my two negative distributed loads pointing down. I don't know a much clearer way to do it. It's just, it's just kind of a messy thing. Okay, and then I put my distances on there of 16 feet. So now that we have this, we can solve this like a statics problem. So if I come to my conjugate beam and I sum moments about B, I want to take all my loads and my theta A reaction and sum them about B, I find that theta A is equal to a positive 333 pound feet squared and remember that we have to put in our material and geometric properties because it's going to deflect differently depending on those things. So I'm going to put that over EI. And positive means that my assumed direction is correct, which means that this is acting counterclockwise. Now for point C, we're going to need to do a little bit of work here. We need a deflection at C. 
So I'm going to take a section on my conjugate beam at AA. Now I've already solved for theta A, so I'm going to go ahead and take my section to the left side. We've solved for theta A, and it is 333 pound feet squared all over EI. So we need to solve for our internal forces at C. What happens when we section a beam? We have internal shear and internal moment. So that's exactly what we have here. We don't have an internal moment, normal force on our conjugate beam, but we still have shear and moment. So there they are. And moment on a conjugate beam is deflection. So now I'm going to take a moment about C. When I sum moments about C, I have my trapezoid that I broke up into a triangle and a rectangle. And then I just went ahead and added my two 100s together. So I got a 200 magnitude there. And then I have my reaction, theta A times eight. And last, I will add my deflection at C. Solving for my deflection at C, I get a positive 1600 pound feet cubed. And again, we're going to put that over EI. And we assumed it, compression in the top. We came out with a positive answer, which means it is deflecting up. This time, we're given a cantilevered beam with a triangular load, and we want to find the slope and deflections at B. This system is already fixed at A, so let's draw the moment diagram to A. So for our conjugate beam, we're going to have the same 9 meter length. And we're going to load it with our third degree distributed load. It has a maximum value of 810 kilonewton meters. Now at A, we have a fixed end, so no rotation, no deflection. At B, we have a free end, which means it is going to deflect and it's going to have a slope. Now that I have my conjugate beam drawn, I can sum for forces in the y direction. Solving for our slope at B, we find that it is 1,820 kilonewton meters squared. And we need to put that over our properties, E and I. And then if I want to find the deflection at B, I'm going to sum moments. And solving for the deflection at B, I get a positive 13,100 kilonewton meters cubed. So that means I assumed it the correct direction. I've got it acting down, compression in the bottom. And by the way, I got slope positive, so that means it's counterclockwise. Let's say that we are given this propped cantilever that has a fixed end at A, hinge at B, roller at C, and a free end that is loaded with a moment of 160 pound-feet at D. We want to find the slopes at B, and no, that's not a typo, there's two. The elastic curve for this beam is going to do something like this, where that hinge at B that allows for rotation is going to have two different slopes here. So we need to solve for both of those. Our solution is going to start with our moment diagram by superposition, and I'm going to fix it at A. With the moment diagram by superposition drawn, I can now draw my conjugate beam. A is a fixed end, so it does not have any rotation or translation. D is a free end, so it is going to have both. And C and B are those special cases that we talked about earlier. So at B, we're going to replace that with a roller. And at C, we are going to replace that with an internal hinge.
I've also got my beam loaded with that moment diagram by superposition. Now roller B is going to create a reaction BY. Okay, and I'm writing it that way because it's not a slope or a deflection. It's this conjugate reaction, uh, fake reaction here that we need to find the slopes on either end. With our conjugate beam set up this way, I have three unknowns. And two of them are in the y direction. So if I sum for forces in the y direction, I have two unknowns. If I sum moments about B or D, I will still have two unknowns. So I'm going to start by taking a section from A to C. Because C is a hinge, I am going to have slope at C, and that will be all. No normal forces on a conjugate beam. So now I can sum moments about B and get theta C. And I get theta C to be 426 and two thirds pound feet squared all over EI. I got a positive answer, so that means that my slope at C is acting up. So now I can take another section, and I'm going to take it just before the conjugate roller B, and I'm going to call that section AA. And with this free body diagram, I have theta B right. So this is the slope of B on the right side of the hinge on my original given beam. I can solve for this, summing for forces in the Y direction. And I find that the slope of theta b to the right is a negative 107 pound feet squared over ei. Coming back up here, I'm going to want to take a section bb which is just to the left of my reaction BY, so I need to solve for that right quick. And we find that BY reaction, the conjugate reaction of the fake roller to be a placeholder for our hinges two different slopes is a negative 426.6. So when I add that to my conjugate beam section BB, which is just to the left of the roller, I get a theta BL of a positive 320 pound feet squared over EI. So positive means that it is actually sloped counterclockwise. So I came back up here and fixed my elastic curve I had coming down at the hinge, but there's no load to cause it to come down. So what we're seeing is if I draw a tangent line, theta B left, it's going to be acting counterclockwise. And if I draw a tangent line here, theta B right is going clockwise. 